Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study we are having tonight. We do praise your name because you are an unchanging God. We know that the way you helped men and women in troublous times in the past, you are still willing to help those who are in trouble today. Oh Lord, I pray, as we study this psalm today, that you will open our eyes, that you will inspire and instruct us, that you will lead us into yourself as refuge and fortress, that you will give us confidence and courage as we trust in your never failing strength and arm. Lord, we pray that the same way that the psalmist trusted in you, you will grant us the faith to trust in you and to be under the shield, the protection, the cover of your love and power. Be with us, Lord. Give us confidence and assurance as we study together even now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Today, as we have done for a few weeks now, we're still studying from the book of the Psalms. Today, we're looking at Psalm 9. It has 20 verses. And I've tried to read through, in fact, over and over a number of times. So I can get what the Lord is revealing. What the Lord is sharing with us. For our faith, for our courage, for our boldness, fortitude. In the time of distress and trouble or trials. Now, the psalmist, like an average man, had troubles and trials that call for dependence upon the power and the promises of God. David, as a king, had much opposition, an attack against his kingdom and against the nation that he ruled over. Yet his triumph in every circumstance came as a result of his trust in God. He prayed much, and his prayers made him victorious over all his enemies, Enemies that were near, enemies that were far. And as we study the things he went through, the prayers he prayed, the triumph he received, the victory that he got, we study with the attitude of knowing that what God did with him and through him is able to deal with us and through us. This psalm that we're studying today is one of David's psalms of prayer and praise. In it, he expresses his attitude, gratitude to the sovereign God who is always faithful to his people. David here acknowledged the presence and the persecution of mighty enemies. Yet his confidence in the Almighty was confirmed every turn of the way. Beginning with a word of thanksgiving in this psalm, he closes the psalm with a note of triumph. Today, his example challenges us to unswerving faith in God. Each man in the world has enough problems to compel him to pray and to trust in God. As David and the worthies of old found protection and preservation in God and through God, so can each trusting believer today. We can glory in the sovereign power of God, whatever enemies are against our nation, or God's kingdom is judged today, or our personal progress in spiritual and temporal things. This we believe. This we affirm that God is still on the throne. And victory can be our constant, constant experience as we study and meditate on the four subtopics in the psalm. The psalm is divided into four parts. One, praise or thanksgiving. Two, power over the terrible. Three, preservation from trouble. Four, Punishment for transgressors. Let's look at the psalm now and see what the body of the psalm itself 
is revealing about God, about the need of our having faith in God, about the triumph, the victory we can have over every opposition, in every circumstance of life, whatever, whoever the enemy may be. And also the need to praise the name of the Lord every time. Point one, praise with thanksgiving. Psalm 9 verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Verse 2. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Be clear among the people his doings. Verse 14. That I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. You can see from those verses I have read from Psalm 9 that the psalmist was full of praises to the Lord, gratitude and thanksgiving. This psalmist, both by example and exhortation, teaches us to be thankful and to praise God constantly. In verse 9, in verse 1, he says, I will. That is, he said, I will not depend upon how I feel. Neither will I look into the future and borrow from the troubles of tomorrow. Neither will I brood over the things that have happened in my life. But I will, I will, I will rejoice in the fact that God has done marvelous works in my life. He determined, he decided that he will praise the Lord. So should we. In verse 2, he still committed himself to saying, I will be glad. I will not allow sorrow. I will not allow sadness to rule over my heart. I will be glad and rejoice. Yet, he was not going to rejoice even over his enemies. He was not going to rejoice even in the surplus or the plenty that God might have given him. He was not going to rejoice in the position that God had, might have given him in life. He was going to rejoice in God. Whatever our victories, whatever our provisions, whatever our achievements, whatever our blessings and benefits, first and foremost, let us rejoice in the giver, not only in the gift. Let us rejoice in the Savior, in the Helper, not only in the help. Let us rejoice in our deliverer, not only in the deliverance. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. Let us rejoice in the provider, not only in the abundance. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. In verse 11, he exhorts us. He preaches to us. He instructs us to praise the Lord. He said, sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Then he tells us, declare among the people his doings. Here, after he himself had given his testimony, after he had expressed thanksgiving and gratitude to God, he now commands and compels us. He exhorts us that we too ought to praise the name of the Lord. We ought to declare among the people his doings. What an encouragement. That we ought to give our testimonies every time. To show forth all his praise in the gate, at the door, at the courts or the entrance of the house of the Lord, or in the midst of the congregation of the saints of God. He praised God for every blessing he had received. And even in the face of the enemy's threat, the psalmist still praised the Lord. For the deliverance he has given, faith faces the future without fear because it has behind it a past that testifies of the trust, trustworthiness and the power of the Lord. And no less than wholehearted praise is due to the Lord for his, for his marvelous works. That's why he said, I will.
praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. For David, it was a wholehearted sin in praising the name of the Lord. Let's look at Psalm 35, verse 28. Psalm 35, verse 28. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. The psalmist said, with my children early in the morning, the beginning of the day, my tongue will speak of thy righteousness and thy praise. With neighbors and acquaintances that I meet in the middle of the day, my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and thy praise all the day. With friends and co-workers that I may meet during the day, all the day long will my tongue speak of thy praise. In the midst of friends, fellow believers, when I come into the congregation of the righteous till part of the day, my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long, in fact, even before my enemies. As I realize that God sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies, even before them, will I praise the name of the Lord and exalt the name of God that the enemies on circumcised Philistines may defy. You see, we need to learn from David that whatever we're going through, we should remember what God has already done for us and we should declare His praise all the day long, morning, noon, night. In Psalm 51, verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Now the psalmist said, My mouth will not pour out complaint or murmur against the Most High, but that at every moment his mouth, his lips are opened. He will make sure that his mouth will show forth the praise of the Lord. Many people, because they do not realize how great God is, and that his name shall be praised every time. And because they do not realize that praise works wonders. They open their mouths in bitterness, complaint, murmur. They are full of grumbling and complaint, but not the psalmist. He said, they will praise the Lord. And so should we. Because if we praise the Lord, we will discover that the Lord Almighty dwelleth in the praises of of his people. In Psalm 66, verse 16, come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Come, he said, and hear. And he was not one to pour complaints into their ears. He was not going to talk about the persecution of Saul against his life. He was not going to talk about the betrayal of his own son Absalom unto the people. Neither was he going to complain about the abuse of Shimei against his life. He wasn't going to be repeating before the people all the disappointment he had from Ahithophel. Neither was he going to talk about his life being endangered before the Philistines. Neither was he going to talk about the people that rejected his rule and authority over them. Come, he said, and hear. All ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Brothers and sisters, what do we declare to people around us? To friends, to neighbors, sisters, what do you declare to your fellow sister, to your prayer partner? What are the words you speak out? Are they words of praise? You wonder why David or how David had such victory in his life. Because his life was filled with praise and thanksgiving. He looked at his life and he could always count or tell the goodness of the Lord upon his life. Because of that, the Lord blessed him abundantly and he had power over his enemies. Psalm, sorry, Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 63. Verse 7. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. 
and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. Here again, the prophet tells the people that this is what he will mention. The praises of the Lord, his loving kindnesses that he has bestowed upon us as a family, as a nation. Can't we say the same thing today? That God has blessed us as a family corporately has blessed us as a church in the assembly. And therefore, we will make mention of the great goodness of the Lord, the loving kindnesses, the abundance of mercy of the Lord unto us. We need to praise the Lord. Even children, even new, new converts, even babes in the Lord ought to join the congregation of the righteous in praising the name of the Lord. And we bless his name because in our midst here we have seen many times how children and men and women have come up here, standing up here, to give testimony to the great goodness of the Lord. But we ought to continue and we ought to realize it is not only when we are here in the house of God. But everywhere we are, let's always open our mouth in gratitude and thanksgiving unto the Lord. Luke chapter 19, verse 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God. The whole multitude without anybody being exempted, without anybody being disgruntled, without anybody drawing back his praise, adoration, and worship from the Lord. The whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Why? For all the mighty works that they had seen. Have you not seen mighty works in the church here? Have you not seen the mighty power of God saving souls, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, and providing for the poor and needy, sanctifying souls, making us holy, baptizing in the Holy Ghost the people that are sanctified? Have you not seen God protecting us miraculously? Have you not seen the things that they seen? that the Lord has done, that even the enemies of the gospel would say, this is marvelous in our eyes, then praise the Lord. Then glorify his name. Join the multitude of disciples, of believers, and rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which we have seen. Now, let's go to point two in our study. Psalm 9. I want to read now from verse 3. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause, and sattest in the throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. Verse 13. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffered of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Verses 19 and 20. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Here, David the psalmist makes mention of power over the terrible. Now, I have a Title this subsection, Power 
over the terrible. The tendency is to be terrified by the enemy as if he were so terrible. And in fact, the Bible makes us to understand that the enemy sometimes is referred to as the terrible. And yet we have power over the enemy, over the terrible. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 21. And I will declare, I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Now, the wicked, the enemy, the oppressor, the persecutor, the hidden, is referred to here as the terrible. And David rejoiced in the Lord because God granted him victory, power over the enemy, over the wicked. Over the heathen. You see David had many enemies. That fought against his life. Against his kingdom. Against the nation. Enemies rose against him. Within his family circle. Among his own servants. Within and outside the nation. His life and progress. Were threatened on every side. Yet he trusted in the just and righteous God who turned his enemies back from him. The very presence of the divine was sufficient to rout the foe. The enemies fell and they perished in the presence of the Almighty. Those enemies and the enemy cities were destroyed. And he prayed and he said, Lord, defeat these enemies on my behalf. In verse 20, he put it this way, that they may know themselves to be but men. He wanted God to defeat those enemies so that those enemy nations or those individuals that post themselves as enemies of David will know that they were mere men, mortal men, frail men, weak men. One day they are breathing and living. The other day they have stopped breathing and they die. Men will not prevail. Men cannot prevail over the man who prevails in prayer with God. Let's look at what God himself has promised concerning the people of God. Those who trust in him. And tonight, if you trust in God, you will have victory over every enemy. God will give you power and victory over the terrible. In Exodus chapter 23 verse 27 Exodus 23 verse 27 I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee brothers and sisters no one likes to be defeated by the enemy whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Nobody likes to be overpowered, overcome by the enemy, whether a believer or an unbeliever. Nobody likes his enemy to kill him and rejoice over him, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And the Lord has promised us victory, power over the enemy. You see, the Lord knows that his plan in our lives will be defeated if our enemies will have the victory over us. And therefore he has given us the victory. And has given us the assurance that he will not allow enemies to rejoice over us. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Luke 10 19. This is New Testament. And these words come from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he wants us to love both friends and enemies. He wants us to love both believers and unbelievers. And yet, he does not want us to surrender and submit to the power, the destructive power of the enemy. He wants us to have the victory. 
And I believe that you too, you want to have the victory. God has promised. And God will give us victory in every circumstance of life. In Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing from the enemy. A charm or a maneuvering, a device. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. That means that like God gave victory, triumph, to the Old Testament worthies by his promises and power. So is the Lord giving us the victory even today over every enemy power. In Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 29 Second Chronicles 20 29 And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. God fought against the enemies of Israel. Why? Because Israel's enemies were God's enemies. Those enemies hated Israel because of the name of God. Because of the plan of God. Because of the choice of God, of Israel. Therefore, those that opposed Israel were actually opposing God. And so God fought against them as his own enemies. Is there any difference in the New Testament? Those who fight against believers are fighting against Christ. That's why Jesus confronted Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus, persecuting and injuring the church. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Until this very day, the Spirit of the Lord is still defending and protecting the children of God from the power of their enemies. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19. Isaiah 59 verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Now listen to this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. That was the experience of David. That is the experience of every trusting, believing, faithful child of God. Trust in the Lord. That will be your experience. He will give you power over the terrible. Let's go back to Psalm 9. Now we want to see preservation from troubles. Psalm 9, from verse 9. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Again, let me remind you that as we study the book of the Psalms, we have a great heritage because of the preservation of the goodness of God, the promises of the Lord for the children of God. This allows us to see how to deal with problems in our lives. The psalmist, all the psalmists without exception, they went through the normal troubles of life. Some of them even went through some exceptional troubles in their lives. But God delivered them. I dare tell you, there is no experience that the average person goes through in life that you cannot see in the Psalms. Do you know that even the sufferings of Jesus Christ, his betrayal, his crucifixion, the persecution, the lies against him, even his death, all are portrayed in the Psalms. Do you know his victory, his resurrection? And the triumph that God gave him and raised him from the dead. Do you know that all are portrayed in the Psalms? From David to the son of David. From the king of Israel to the king of kings. And everyone in between. God has preserved something in the Psalms for us. Are you a new convert? Are you an old convert? 
Are you an old timer? Have you been following the Lord for a long time? Are you facing trouble, trial, persecution, perplexities in your life? All your experiences are portrayed in the Psalms. And the way you can have protection, preservation, are all portrayed in the Psalms. That is why none of us should miss the study of the Psalms. And I plead with you, let's join hands together. And invite the people that have not been coming. If we love them. If we want the people uh, to be free from all their troubles. You see, that is why I have taken a greater trouble. To personally handle these Psalms, these days, these weeks now, myself. So that you will be able to get the best out of what the Psalms have to offer. Brothers and sisters, once again, let's join hands together. And invite our brothers and sisters who are not here. Look around those who are not here today. Let's call them in. Come back to this verse 9. Preservation from troubles. Are you going through to trouble? The Lord will preserve you. The Lord will protect you. The Lord will make you to overcome this present troubled circumstance of your life. Trouble in the family. Trouble in the place of work. Are there some things happening to you, even among people that are called brethren, that shock you, that surprise you, that bring so much burden upon your life? There's preservation and protection for you. Look up to the Lord. Lift up your eyes of faith unto the Lord. The Lord will deliver you. Look at verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For the Lord, thou Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Verse 12. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. The Lord will not forget, will not overlook, will not neglect your cries, your tears. In Psalm 27, verse 5, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, he shall set me up Upon a rock. Personalize that verse in your own life. In the time of trouble, he will hide me, even me. Why do you think he will protect others but will not protect you? Why do you think he will show his love to others and not to you? You must understand that this is personally written for you. He will hide me, even me, in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide me, even me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm 91, verse 15. Psalm 91, verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Why don't you claim that? I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Psalm 138 verses 7 and 8 Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 25, verses 4 and 5. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud 
the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. These are promises we can stand upon when the storm is raging. The psalmist expressed his faith and confidence in God as refuge in times of trouble, as a shelter from the storms of life, knowing that God's name and his nature is a refuge or fortress for him. He then encourages all who are in trouble to put their trust in him. In his testimony, he observed that the Lord has not forsaken them that seek him. By his knowledge of God and his acquaintance with the Almighty, he affirmed that he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Brothers and sisters, have faith in God, for he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 27 to 29. Deuteronomy chapter 33, from verse 27 to verse 29. The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out, cast out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. I believe you will dwell in safety. In the day and in the night, God will protect you. The church today will dwell in safety. Jesus Christ himself has said, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel. Happy art thou, O church. Happy art thou, O child of God, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy hell. And who is the sword of thy excellency? Thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. Thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. Thou shalt tread upon their high places. Let's look at the fourth point as we rejoice of the psalmist. In the God of power, the God of justice, and the God who will not neglect or overlook the cry of the oppressed. Psalm 9. Now this brings me to point 4. Punishment for transgressors. Psalm 9. Verse 7 and verse 8. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. From verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid. Is their own food taken? The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. The psalmist speaks clearly of the judgment of the wicked. God is shown as a righteous judge who maintains the cause of the upright and rebukes or punishes the ungodly. On earth, the wicked sink into the pit that they make for others. Enemies of the truth, enemies of progress, enemies of the righteous are ensnared by the nets and traps of their own making. And then the psalmist ends up by that fearful, final, terrible, terrifying judgment upon the wicked. He says, after death, the wicked and all who forget God are turned 
into hell. The Bible makes us to understand there is judgment for the sinner. Punishment for the unrighteous, the ungodly, even after death. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We are told in Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Look at verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Judgment is coming upon the wicked, upon the enemies of righteousness, upon the heathen, upon the people that reject the way of God, and persecute the children of God. Judgment is coming upon the people that refuse to be saved. For us who are children of God, we can rejoice for the psalmist. We can raise up our praise and thanksgiving voice of gratitude to the Lord. Because he will give us victory. He will make us triumphant. He will give us power over the terrible. And in life, whatever may be the plan. Whatever may be the persecution, whatever may be the program of the enemies against our lives, we can be sure God will preserve us from trouble. Let's put our faith in Him. Let's put our trust in Him. Let's have confidence in Him. Let us pray unto Him. Let us praise His name. But for the unbeliever, if you are here tonight, I want you, call upon the name of the Lord. Why will you wait for the fair indignation and punishment and judgment of God to fall upon you here in the world or after death? Let's all rise up. Rise up on your feet and talk to the Lord in prayer. You are a saint of God, a child of God. Praise the Lord. Worship Him. Show gratitude unto Him. Pray. Raise up your voice of gratitude and thanksgiving unto the Lord. Look at the promises of God. See how he has said he will protect us and preserve us. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for the wondrous works he has manifested. Make a decision that you will continue to praise the Lord all the day long. Every time, anytime, wherever you find yourself. And if enemies like the terrible are against your life, put your faith in God. He's able, abundantly able, to deliver, to deliver. He's able, abundantly able, to deliver all who trust in Him. How strong is the enemy? Not as strong as God. God will convince those enemies that they are but men, only men, mortal men, frail and weak men. Trust in the Lord. Put your trust in Him. Don't fear. He will preserve you from trouble. Call upon Him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And if you have not been born again, you have not given your life to the Lord, do it right now. Do it today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And all his promises and promises.